position requires no sympathy at all. Because by that time, my right arm was already out. She had told us, she had told us the full, unfortunate, regrettable story. And she'd done so with an honesty and a candor which all of us have received with great relief and much sympathy for her. Because it isn't easy when you are in charge of government to have to come and say that certain things happen that you would have wished otherwise. And instead of the right honourable gentleman, the government, having the decency to say, well, now we've heard this story, it's not a very good story, but we've accepted it. He gets up on his high moral horse and he starts lecturing us again about the honesty and the decency of office. That right honourable gentleman, I wish he was here, and he's probably appearing on television, because I would like to say in this place, of course, that it was in the government that was the very model of traffic. He was a member of a government that took the decision about the shepherd. He then came to high office. So unlike the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, he knows that he's a member of the government.
where that national interest might lie. Mr. Speaker, it's always unfortunate. Now, I just, Mr. Speaker, ask this It is always unfortunate when mistakes are made. It is always best to come to the budget. My right honourable friend has done that for a little measure today. The government may have suffered from what happened in the last two or three weeks. It is a temporary setback. Thank <laughs> you.
miners at Orkney's and now he's gone. So as far as I'm concerned, the loss of those two ministers is a plus and they must be delighted in the NUM and CND to find these two men have gone. But the House has other concerns. The first thing was the question of the official secretary. A few months back, Sarah Tisdall, out of principle, released to the press Dingham comes from the Guardian too, that might be remembered. But she
to be hauled up on a standing floor at number 10. And therefore, this is a very important debate. Goes well beyond the Prime Minister talk on Bernard Ingham, which I'm sure, and I believe other people who know Bernard Ingham will that he would not have so acted, had not had the clearest
to put this matter officially behind them in the constant reassurance that the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, perhaps, perhaps at long last, but the Prime Minister has come clean with the House and with the public. Well, let's just examine what the Prime Minister told us today. Not a great deal. She told us that the first she discovered of the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry's behaviour in the matter was at the end of the inquiry. Secondly, that some hours after the leak had occurred, she was told in general terms of her office's involvement. Thirdly, she told us how the inquiry came to be instituted. Now, how the addition of these small pieces of information, interesting though they are, changes the situation from last Thursday when the Prime Minister was floundering about our inability to answer these questions and now suddenly we have to be told that it's all been cleared up. Well, Mr Speaker, it has not all been cleared up. And the question which will be asked again and again is a very simple one. Before the Prime Minister decided to institute the bogus inquiry, because bogus is now what we know it was, the bogus inquiry into the leak, did she know of any of the involvement of her ministers and of officials? Now, I have to concede we've got a partial answer on one leg of that. So far as the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry is concerned, she says she did not know of his involvement. Now, that is a little curious, because because he says, and she said when she made a statement about this matter the other day, that he telephoned up or caused his officials to communicate with number 10 on the basis that subject to the agreement of number 10, uh, then certain action uh, was to be taken. It is odd that that was there and signalled from the beginning, apparently, and yet the second Prime Minister says that she did not know of his involvement until after this laborious inquiry had been completed. Well, but let that matter stand. Uh, what we don't know is uh, whether she knew from her officials of their involvement in the leak prior to the setting up of the inquiry. That question simply has not been answered. It will be asked and it will be asked and it will be asked again until it is answered. But uh, the question, uh, Mr Speaker, is not an idle one. This is not uh, one of a small matter of the mismanagement of government. This, an unfortunate leak, a slip something that arose out of an unfortunate but genuine misunderstanding, we are told. Let me remind you of what the Solicitor General wrote to the Secretary of State for Defence in the letter which has only become available today, uh, having been declassified and put in the library before this debate started. I quote from the penultimate paragraph. This is the Solicitor General writing to the Secretary of State for Defence the day after the leak occurred. And he says, on a different aspect of this matter, I want to express my dismay that a letter containing confidential legal advice from a law officer to one of his colleagues should have been leaked and apparently leaked moreover in a highly selective way. Quite apart from the breach of confidentiality that is involved, the rule is very clearly established that even the fact that law officers have tendered advice in a particular case may not be disclosed without their consent, let alone the content of such advice. It is plain that in this instance this important rule was immediately and flagrantly violated. So let us get to the situation on the 7th of January when the Solicitor General knows that a flagrant violation has occurred. Now this is the time when the Prime Minister has been told in general terms of our office's involvement. Well she certainly must have known that there was a leak. It was on the front page of the Times, it was on the front page of the Sun, it was on the front page of the Mail. I think it got into the Evening Standard on that very day. And in lurid headlines, the Daily Mail says, The Great Cabinet Shambles, Open War as Ministers Attack Heseltine. The Times, Heseltine told by Law Chief, stick to the facts. Uh, and it goes on in that vein, and I think the Sun, uh, true to form, has a simple headline, You Liar. <laughs> now, this is all happening on the 7th. It is quite clear that a flagrant violation has occurred. That's what the Solicitor General tells us. Now, I assume that the Prime Minister knew about the rule, about law officers. I assume she knew about that. Now, what was her reaction to that? Did she have people in and say, a flagrant violation has occurred, I'm not putting it up with it in this government which I run, and I want to find out what went on? No, nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened from the Prime Minister until the Attorney General stirs himself, realising that a flagrant violation has occurred, 
And he doesn't go to the Prime Minister, apparently, which is very strange. He goes to the head of the civil service. Now, maybe he thought he would get a more sympathetic response there than going to the Prime Minister. Uh, he might be able to get the complaint out before he received his letter of dismissal, perhaps, uh, going by that route through the head of the civil service. However, he goes to the head of the civil service, who then minutes the Prime Minister three days later on the 10th, and then she says, I readily, uh, readily uh, gave my authority for an inquiry to commence. The question must be, why did it take the Attorney General and the Head of the Civil Service yeah, yeah. to remind the Prime Minister yeah, of her yeah, constitutional yeah, responsibility yeah, yeah, yeah. as a government in this country? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why did she remain inactive? That's charge number one. Charge number two is, is it really true that the Prime Minister knew nothing about the activities of her civil servants in number 10? And in this regard, in this regard, Mr. Speaker, let me remind you of something which happened this very afternoon. My honourable friend, the member for Lithgow, rose in his place and put a question to the Prime Minister, and he referred to a question uh, on column 455 of the Hansard of 23rd January, put by the Chairman of the 1922 Committee, the honourable member for Woking, uh, to the Prime Minister. Now, I hope the House will forgive me if I just qu quote the question and answer, because I believe it's of profound importance. The question from the Honourable Gentleman was, my Right Honourable Friend will be aware that many of the Right Honourable and Honourable Members of the Opposition Benches, like the Right Honourable Member for Plymouth Devonport, are not really interested in listening to the facts of the full account given by Right, right Honourable Friend. What view does my Right Honourable Friend think that the House might have taken of any Minister in any government placed in such an invidious situation by the action of a colleague who had failed in his duty to ensure that correct information was made public as soon as possible. Now, he's quite clearly referring to the conveying of the information, right. suggesting that it was necessary for a minister to make sure that that information was communicated. There can hardly be any doubt about that. Nor was there any doubt, apparently, in the Prime Minister's mind as to the meaning of the question, because she replies, Yes, Mr Speaker, it would have been much easier, as the facts were commercially sensitive, if the relevant letters had been cleared, as mine was with the Solicitor General. It was vital to have accurate information in the public domain because we knew that judgments might be founded upon that and that the government could be liable if wrong judgments were made as a result of the misleading information. It was to get that accurate information to the public domain that I gave my consent. Yeah. Yeah. did the Prime Minister tell us last Thursday that she gave her consent to the leaking of the letter into the public domain? The Prime Minister getting to her feet. I'll gladly reply to the, to the right honourable gentleman. I was quite content that I had given a whole account in the statement cleared in every single detail, in every single detail, and the account in this statement was absolutely accurate. I know, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister's statement was gone over like a tooth comb, the one she read out here. It's yeah. full of all the weasel words. It became accepted as a matter of duty. Yeah. Cover instead of authority. Yeah. All these curious words that have been yeah. fashioned and honed after many months, yes. hours of consultation uh, to get, the, get it right. Yeah. She was okay when she was on the statement, Mr. Speaker, but this was a question that took her slightly out with the range of the question. Yeah. And the question couldn't have been clearer. And she said, I gave my consent. Yeah. And today, and today, Mr. Speaker, when she was asked about it by my honourable friend, the member from Lithgow, we all heard her say, when I said consent, I meant consent to the inquiry. Right. Now, I must say, Mr Speaker, I felt that something had gone wrong there, and I immediately checked in the answer. Now, it's obvious for everyone to see that the Prime Minister was not meaning that. So she either gave us a wrong answer then, or she gave us a wrong answer today. They both can't stand together. Which one was it? So on this record of Hansard, the Prime Minister admits that she gave her consent to the leaking of the information. Until she publicly corrects that account in the particular and answers the particular allegation which I have made, then the question will remain unanswered. And up gets Mrs. Thatcher once more. Not give my consent to the leaking of the information. May I make that quite, quite clear? Well, if we are to accept the Prime Minister's statement that she did not give her consent 
she was remarkably foolish to say so when she answered a question in the House of Commons. It takes me back to my days in the criminal courts when some people gave unfortunate answers when they were required about their activities. They didn't always get such an understanding way in which it was received later on. I made a mistake. <laughs> says the Prime Minister. Did she make a mistake when she put it into answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that is one of the unanswered questions, and there are more. But what is worrying, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, people who care about good government in this country, is that it is typical of this administration. I'm sorry to say that there is no surprise throughout the country yeah, yeah, at the yeah. evasions, at the denials, right. at all the rum goings on of recent weeks and recent months. Right. There's no surprise that ha things should happen in this way. And it is, Mr Speaker, because the standards of good government in this country have been steadily yeah, deteriorating yeah, yeah, under the rule of the Prime Minister. It is why, it is why it appears to be enough to come to the House of Commons and get cheers from the ruling party for saying, I think matters should have been handled in a different way. Handled? handled. handled? Why can't the Prime Minister say it was wrong, it shouldn't have been happened, and I'm taking steps to make sure it doesn't happen again? No, it's all a matter of handling. It's a matter of manipulation. It's a matter of presentation. Mr Speaker, I hope the time will come soon in this House of Commons when ministers, including the Prime Minister, when asked straight questions, will give honest answers. When, when, when we will have a government in whose competence as well as whose integrity we can have confidence. Because, Mr Speaker, the problem is this. If we accept the explanation that has been given to us, it is a sorry tale of woeful incompetence. And if we cannot accept it, the whole integrity of the administration is suspect. And, Mr Speaker, this matter, I'm sorry to tell the government, simply will not give away, go away. It will not go away. It will not go away, despite the attempts of the party opposite, uh, carefully planned throughout this day, carefully planned to disrupt the speech of my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, planned carefully in advance because the Conservative Party's tenacious defence of power is ruthless and is absolute. But unfortunately for them, they've been found out, and they're being found out daily by the public. Yeah. And now, the Leader of the Commons, John Biffin. <laughs> Mr Speaker, frequently the knowledge that a debate is to rise upon a motion for the adjournment is a matter for regret and some disparagement. But this afternoon has demonstrated that the motion on the adjournment, shot through with passion and arguments of principle, can put this House in the best possible light. And I say that in respect of the whole range of speeches, including the one that we have just heard from the honourable, right honourable gentleman the member for Lanark. But if the debate, very, if the debate, well, it's not difficult to flatter the right honourable gentleman. I agree, it's rather more difficult for some who sit behind him. <coughs> Can I now say that, of course, the House um, very properly has considered the matter in the forum of this chamber this afternoon, but my honourable friend, the member for East Hampshire, has reminded us that. Uh, there are departmental select committees also investigating the wide range of issues that have been debated and which I have no doubt will continue to be a matter of continuing parliamentary interest. But I want to draw the attention of my honourable friends and of the House to probably three aspects of this afternoon's debate. One concerns, I think in a very real sense, tragedy. The other, the major lesson, I believe, for Parliament and for the Treasury bench. And finally, to draw the attention of my honourable friends to a dire political warning implicit in what is now being argued. First, as far as the point of tragedy is concerned, the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, have uh, drawn attention to the continuing shadows over the future of Westland, a future which cannot be assisted by the current political difficulties, and a future which we must all hope will shortly be resolved. But it was um, particularly in terms of tragedy that I and many of my colleagues will feel deeply 
the loss of two colleagues over this uh, issue. My right honourable friend, the member for Henley. Mr. My Hesseltine. My right friend, the member for Richmond. Mr. Pritchard. My honourable friend, the member for Horsham, paid a very warm tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for Richmond, which I thoroughly underline. And my right honourable friend for Henley has given the clearest possible indication that he returns... That he returns... Order. Fred, Order. with tremendous enthusiasm <laughs> and the nervous laughter of the benches opposite show how much they will be frustrated in their hope they were to see some form of civil war within the Tory party over this matter. For I say that the speech of my right honourable friend this afternoon indicates that this for the government benches, for the Conservative Party, is no parliamentary Dunkirk, but rather a parliamentary Alamein. <laughs> Conservative MPs smiling at that, as well as uh, no. the raucous laughter that you can hear from the Labour benches. say, when I look at the hamster from Bolsover... Reference to Mr Dennis Skinner. <laughs> One of the but, main uh, on no, the Mr Labor Speaker, thing. can I turn to what I think to be the most uh, serious and central issue of this whole unhappy business? Namely, the need for effective collective responsibility. No one... No one could doubt that, on reading the remarks of my right honourable and noble friend in another place, Lord Whitelaw, on